Good night. It is Monday, the 4th of September, 2023. It's 18 minutes past 10 p.m. I'm going to be sharing with you um, the right. And this is chapter 16. And it's called Organising the Ministry. It's only about 10 pages long, as far as I know. But... Uh, just begin with one or two simple prayers in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Prayer of Entrustment Dear and loving Mother Mary, keep your hand upon me this day. Oh, you know what? I forgot to put the microphone in front of me. My apologies. I'm sharing with you the right the book the right chapter 16 organizing the ministry in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit amen prayer of entrustment dear and loving mother mary keep your hand upon me this day evening guard my mind my heart and any sense my senses that I may not commit sin. Make my thoughts, affections, words and actions holy, so that I may be pleasing to you and to your divine Son, Jesus, and attain heaven with you. Jesus and Mary, give me your holy blessing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom God's love entrusts me here, ever this night be at my side, to light and guard, to rule and guide. Amen. Holy Michael, Archangel, defend me in this day of battle. Be my safeguard against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, I humbly pray. And do thou, Prince of the heavenly host, by the power of God, thrust down to hell Satan, and all the wicked evil spirits who wander through the world for the ruin of souls. Amen. So reading The Rite, The Making of a Modern Exorcist by Matt Baglio. Spiritual warfare this is. Father Giancarlo Gramolazzo says, The profession of exorcism has meaning if we as exorcists, through possession and exorcism, prove that God is not only present but stronger. This is a path of faith. And I always tell that to the families I meet with in a parish where there is a possessed person. It is through the grace of God that these people can rediscover the evangelical message of our faith. Chapter 16 has a title, Organising the Ministry. And we're following a father, Gary, from America. He's in Rome and uh, we're following him for most part through the whole book. In late March, Father Gary's bishop, along with other priests from the Diocese of San Francisco and San Jose, came to Rome for the ceremony creating Archbishop Levada as cardinal and though only in town for a week the bishop found time to talk with Gary about his new assignment. Back in November when Father Gary was just four months into his sabbatical his bishop had asked if he would be willing to take over as pastor of Sacred Heart Parish in Saratago, California. 
The two sat in the reading room of the casa one day, discussing the past and Father Gary's desire to bring renewal to the parish. With that business out of the way, his bishop asked him how the exorcism training was going, no doubt half expecting to hear a few dry remarks about a classroom lectures and textbooks. Instead, he was shocked when Father Gary told him that he had seen around 15 exorcisms that week alone. You mean you've actually seen an exorcism? His bishop asked. I have seen about 60, Father Gary said, correcting him. His bishop listened intently as Father Gary briefly described some of the scenes out at San Lorenzo. He mentioned Father Carmine's and other Italian exorcists' complaints that some bishops do not take them seriously. As he talked, Father Gary was careful to reiterate how grateful he was to have had the opportunity to come to Rome and study. Without the training, I would, have n would not have known the first thing about how to proceed, he told his bishop. It was a natural segu into the practical concerns of getting other American exorcists trained. If every diocese is supposed to have an exorcist, then we have a hell of a lot of a work to do. It just was not practical to ask priests to come all the way over to Rome for four months to take the course. One positive development came in the form of a conference in the Midwest that he was planning to attend in August. Apparently, the coordinators were attempting to organise something modelled on the conference of the International Association of Exorcists. This seemed like a good place to start. He and his bishop also needed to establish a protocol for when someone approached him about exorcism, since he would need to get his bishop's permission before proceeding. A system had to be worked out. His bishop promised that they would set it in place when Father Gary got back. In the meantime, Father Gary shared his ideas about the kind of exorcism team he wanted to assemble. Because he was still concerned about discernment, he planned to err on the side of caution and vet potential patients through either a psychiatrist or a psychologist. The challenge would be to find competent doctors who believed in the possibility of demonic possession. That's the key, that they can believe in it, because otherwise it's going to be a difficulty. So I'll repeat that. I'll go back just to, to there. The challenge would be to find competent doctors who believed in the possibility of demonic possession, but who were not overzealous about it, something Father Gary realised could be just as harmful as being too sceptical. In addition, he anticipated having a medical doctor and perhaps a historical theologian something recommended by an exorcist at the Angelicum. Beyond the medical team, he would enlist Father Kevin, also for his ability to speak Spanish, and a couple of other priests as possible helpers. He did not think he was going to use a prayer group just yet, 
something that Father Bamonte had recommended, because Father Carmine had told him how ashamed people could feel. He thought it prudent to avoid distractions or the potential embarrassment that might result from bringing strangers into the room. At the minimum, he would do what Father Carmine did, which was to offer up the person's name at Mass, which is a very good idea. As their meeting came to a close, his bishop told him he was impressed with Father Gary's intentions and he reiterated his support. Even before meeting with his bishop, Father Gary had been thinking about the day when he would have to perform an exorcism because up to now he's only participated, which is quite a different thing. He wasn't in control. He already knew, based on his own experience with depression, that he wanted to establish a measured, calm approach that could help put people at ease and create the right kind of environment for healing. He had been turned off by some of the more fundamentalist books he had read, attributing just about every problem under the sun. For example, doubt, fear, alcoholism, greed to a demon. He found that theologically troubling. As C.S. Lewis so famously said in the screw tape letters, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is dis to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. Well written. For this reason, he planned on starting out small. The first thing he would probably do would be to ask a series of questions. Do you go to Mass? Do you worship or pray? When was the last time you went to confession? If the answers were no, he would most likely get the sufferer to start going back to church and the sacraments before he would perform an exorcism. Of course, he would still offer a simple blessing. Well done, Father Gary. But would it be that easy to convince people to follow this cautious approach? I think he was very wise. He knew from his experiences at St. Nicholas where some of his techno-conscious form of parishioners have, have to have the latest piece of gadgery, ga, ga, sorry, gadgetry, that it was not going to be easy to ask people to slow down and invest their time in something that may not show immediate results. We are a culture of instant gratification, he would later say voicing a criticism that virtually every exorcist shares. Months later, Father Vince would have a similar experience when he tried to get a woman who came to see him to return to Mass. It is almost like people want to believe in the extreme, says Father Vince. I am happy to pray with people, but if I tell them that they need to start going back to church and taking advantage of the sacraments, they look at me like I am crazy for actually suggesting that they practice their faith. And I know if I told them to go out and do the extreme, Go stand on your lawn and swing a dead chicken around your head and you'll be fine. They would do that. But just going to Mass or confession, they think that is kind of mundane. 
there would be other challenges as well, some of them uniquely American, whereas Italy is basically a monocultural, predominantly Catholic society. America is anything, but in Father Gary's estimate, in the Diocese of San Jose alone, more than 100 different languages are spoken. There is a sizable Vietnamese community in town, as well as a large Hispanic population. He would have to know a little about the cultural mores of the various immigrant groups, as well as their traditions, if he was going to become an effective exorcist. Father Gary, <coughs> excuse me, did not pretend to have all the answers. He hoped to be able to share information and get advice from some of the other exorcists in the United States who might have more experience. He has talked to Father Vince, he's also good, as well as an exorcist he knew in Nebraska about the need to begin networking. The problem was the paucity of exorcists. Father Gary had heard that the number was somewhere around 14 officially appointed exorcists in the entire United States. In addition, as he had shared with his bishop, some of these exorcists had received no formal training beyond being handed the ritual. Just trying to work out a common approach would present a challenge, never mind battling a demon. Excuse me for a moment, I must have a drink. Thank you. At the beginning of Lent, Father Gary began participating in Mass each morning at one of the old titular houses, original house churches used by early Christians when nascent Christianity was still outlawed. Each morning he would get up around 5.30 and set out from the casa, along with about 60 other priests, to walk to the one designated for that day of Lent. Typically, the priests would take turns saying Mass at the different churches. When it was Father Gary's turn, he said Mass in San Martino I Monte, a tiny church where it was rumoured that the Nicene Creed had been read aloud for the first time. The experience offered him <coughs> excuse me, a very real reminder of the traditions of the church and once again helped him to reconnect to the roots of his faith. During this time, he also continued witnessing exorcisms three days a week out at San Lorenzo, along with Father Vince. Almost all the people were repeat cases, and by now Father Gary was an old hand and knew what to expect, though there were still a few surprises. During one exorcism, a woman seemed to come out of the trance on her own and say in a normal voice, OK, I'm fine. You can stop praying now. Father Carmine studied her carefully and then threw some holy water onto her, 
causing the demon to explode with rage. They hate holy water and holy objects, holy oil, holy everything. After the sessions, Father Gary and Father Vince continued to compare notes over a coffee. Father Gary was still frustrated that there was not much time to ask questions. The language barrier persisted as well, even for Father Carmine. After one evening of exorcisms, Father Gary suggested that the three of them schedule an hour to sit down and talk and have the English-speaking layman he had met at dinner translate for them. A few weeks after meeting with his bishop, Father Gary was asked to give a talk to a group of priests in the con the continuing education program whom father <coughs> excuse me father vince had regaled with stories from san lorenzo worried that they might one day have to face off against a demon themselves they asked gary if he would be willing to share his knowledge as well the talk took place in the common room of the NAC, used by the seminarians as a sort of TV and game room that included a large collection of travel guides. About 16 priests, most in their mid-50s, showed up for the talk. Perhaps not surprisingly, all had at least one story to tell, either about a candle <coughs> that mysteriously blew out while they were giving a blessing in a windowless room or having run-ins with parishioners who claimed to be cursed. One priest from Atty Amityville, New York, even described an order of nuns in the diocese that he said had begun practising Wicca. Father Gary was his usual candid self, tucking his Roman collar into his front shirt pocket and giving the priests his standard stump speech on the topic. Take the person seriously, ask questions, do not rule out the possibility of demonic possession, but do not rush to judgment and always be conscious that the person is suffering deeply. Evil takes many forms and I think becoming more aware of it through our own spiritual lives will make us better priests. If we want to be able to guide someone else, we have to be aware of evil while not being paranoid about it. But I think if we are oblivious to it or our own prayer life does not cause us to enter into the deeper mystery of it, then I do not think we are serving our people well. When the talk was over, everyone clapped. Afterward, Father Gary and a friend ate at a noisy, packed pizzeria located just off Corso Vittorio Emmanuel II. He was happy with how the talk went. But in truth, he had something else on his mind. In a little over two weeks, it would be time for him to return to California. Sitting in the packed pizzeria with a huge spillover crowd mingling in the street outside reminded him how much he enjoyed the energy of Rome. 
And now that his sabbatical was coming to an end, he realised how much he would miss it. A few days later, Father Kevin Joyce flew out from San Francisco and Father Gary went out to the airport to meet him. The two had a great deal to discuss. Father Kevin had been sent a few cases by the bishop during Father Gary's absence and was eager to get Father Gary's opinion. One woman <coughs> sorry, in her early thirties claimed to have balls of energy fly out of her. At times, her fiancé did not even recognise her. A Hispanic man claimed to hear demonic voices and even see demons from time to time. More than a few times, Father Kevin had been called out to bless a parishioner's houses. As Father Kevin listened to what Father Gary had said about these cases, both became so engrossed that they got on the wrong train and found themselves heading into the countryside rather than toward the centre of the town. Father Kevin could see right away how passionate and excited Father Gary was about all that he had learned. Impressed with new confidence and sense of spiritual growth that he observed in his old friend, he described Father Gary as a changed man and observed, I think with this training you will be a real asset to the diocese, I hope, Father Gary responded, because Father Carmine was out of town for a few days and thus not available to talk with them. Father Gary instead contacted Father Daniel, who was so busy that he could be reached only between 9 and 10 in the evening and asked whether he would come over to the casa to answer a few questions. The three sat in the break room for two hours, talking about exorcism. Father Gary had already discussed many of the topics with the Franciscan, such as the best way to go about blessing houses. But other topics were new, such as how to reorganise the presence of a curse, Oh, sorry, recognise, it's divided, they've got the in between, and about the efficacy of using blessed oil, water and salt, specifically having the possessed person cook with them. In certain cases, Father Daniel even asked people to put a few drops of holy water into the washing machine to purify their clothes which he said helped. Father Daniel also discussed practical issues specific to the United States. For example, he suggested that before Father Gary performed an exorcism on anybody, he might want to draft a consent form for everyone to sign Father Daniel offered another piece of advice that resonated. Never bless a home without making sure the whole family is present. It is a great opportunity to perform a little catechesis and that way you can see if any problem is not related to the house but instead to the family. When they were finished, the two agreed to stay in touch with Father Gary. And Father Gary thanked the Franciscan and promised to let him know what happened with his ministry when he got back to the States. On the Thursday before Holy Week, Father Gary and Father Vince 
went out to San Lorenzo for the last time. Father Carmine had a light load that day and they only they saw only a couple of people until five that afternoon. When the three sat down in Father Carmine's office and talked for about an hour and a half, Father Carmine had finally arranged for the English-speaking layman at San Lorenzo to act as a translator. So Father Gary had no trouble getting answers to all his questions, such as why Father Carmine put holy water in the person's ears or where the demon went when it was not tormenting the person. There were also unexpected moments of levity since the ritual mentions that the exorcist should fast. Father Gary wanted to know whether Father Carmine did this. Once the question had been translated, Father Carmine responded laughingly and patting his protruding belly. I don't fast from food, he said smiling. But then he went on to tell Father Gary that he did fast from other things, such as TV and alcohol, and stated, I have to deal with many humiliations. This is not an easy ministry. Apparently he felt these humiliations were a form of fasting as well. Now, near the end of the discussion, Father Carmine turned to Father Gary and said, It is too bad you have to go home now. Father Gary thanked Father Carmine for being such a kind and generous teacher, saying it would not have been possible to have even contemplated performing the ministry without his invaluable training. As he and Father Vince were getting ready to go, Father Carmine imparted one final piece of advice. During the prayers of exorcism, remember that you are never addressing the person in front of you. You are always invoking the power of God. If you start focusing on this presence of evil in front of you, as if your own self is dealing with it, you will get yourself into trouble because that is not what you are doing. It is what God is doing through you. As a token of his appreciation, Father Gary gave the capuchin a silver-plated image of Padre Pio and thanked him again. With that, as Father Gary and Father Carmine shook hands, the captured him, patted him on the back in a brotherly way. Fea bravo, he said, just before Father Gary left. Be good. The following, in the days following, his visit with Father Carmine, as he organised his things for his return trip to the States, Father Gary reflected on his time in Rome. Not only had his training opened up his eyes, it also changed the way he approached his priestly ministry in many ways. He felt like Father Daniel, who said that now that he knew the reality of the spirit world, he felt more responsibility to do something to help people. To go back now to the way he was before would be like turning my back on God. At the start of April, the city slowly shifted gears as the bundled up days of winter were replaced by the leafy passeggiat of spring. Father Gary had been looking forward to celebrating Easter in Rome. He appreciated the holiday more so than the overly commercialised Christmas, 
For him, Easter was always about baptism and always perhaps an apt time to start a new chapter in his priestly ministry. Father Kevin, who had been in Assisi on a retreat for a few days, returned in time for the two to participate together in the Tridium. The three-day period of Holy Thursday, the day of the Last Supper, Good Friday and the day Christ was crucified and Holy Saturday, the night of the great Paschal Vigil. On Thursday night, Father Gary went to the Mass of the Lord's Supper and afterward out to dinner with Father Kevin. On Good Friday, he went to the Vatican for a three-hour service and, in a coincidence, ran into Father Carmine, which allowed him another opportunity to say grazie. On Holy Saturday night, he went up to the NAC for the Easter Vigil, which he found glorious and deeply spiritual. It also presented him with a chance to say goodbye to many of the seminarians and priests, some of whom he had grown close to and with whom he intended to maintain friendships. I've got a tickle, an itch on my nose. Sorry, excuse me. It's, it's annoying. When he stopped and thought about it, he had never imagined that his sabbatical would have turned out this way. It had been an incredibly enriching experience. When he had told some of the seminarians that he was heading home, a few had said how much they wished they could go home too. Oh, no, you don't, he shook his head. I have had ten months without stress, and now I have to go home to a set of unknowns. Beyond a new parish, perhaps the biggest of these unknowns was about his own abilities as an exorcist. The demons existed, he had no doubt, but... Would they respond to him the way they had responded to Father Carmine? Would the prayers of exorcism work for him? In addition, he worried about the prospect of having to confront a demon on his own. During the exorcisms that he witnessed, most of the demons had directed their attention at Father Carmine. And as an observer, he had remained relatively isolated from that exchange. But as an exorcist, he would now have to bear the brunt of it himself. Would he be able to do that? There would be no way of knowing until he actually performed an exorcism himself. When the vigil was over... It was past midnight and still the streets were packed. Alone now, he walked back to the casa and even though it was late, he felt completely safe. Most of the restaurants and bars were still full, some with people just sitting down. Passing in front of the Pantheon, he followed the crowds heading down via Deo Pastini and toward Via del Corso, comforted by the fact that he knew his way around the city without a map. Certainly a far cry from his first four days at the NAC, when he had been anxious about going out on his own. The nights had warmed up considerably over the past few weeks, making it easier for him to take his time. A few people he passed, flashed him a polite smile, but most ignored him. To them he was just another part of the backdrop, a black-clad figure on his way to one of the many churches in Rome. That is the end of chapter 16.
Thank you so much for listening. May God bless you and heal you. I'm sending you his peace in abundance. And may you always be happy and joyful in the Lord. And God bless the rest of your day, your night, your morning. And the title of next chapter 17 is The Exorcist. So I think that will be an interesting one because maybe, who knows, I don't know, maybe he will be doing his uh, first exorcism and actually telling us about it. I hope he does because I actually have not read the book. I'm reading it with you and I have not... Uh, um, so I'm just looking here to see what I can do as a final closure for the evening of reading the Bible in one year first and now this so so many different ah oh, page 27 yeah this is very interesting I'm sorry about last night I just lost it but hope there won't be any more like that but <laughs> I shall remember that one. But, uh, and I think the next one will be very interesting because he has learnt a lot. He's changed a lot as well, Father Gary. 25. I haven't got any nails on my fingers to turn the pages. Okay. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. As the day draws to a close, close, we place ourselves in an attitude of thanksgiving. We take time to express our gratitude to a loving God for his abiding presence. We thank him for the gift of the day and all it has brought with it. We are grateful to God for all the things we were able to achieve throughout the day and we entrust him with the concerns of tomorrow. From the rising of the setting of the sun, may the name of the Lord be praised. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Can we take a few moments for a brief examination of conscience? We reflect on the ways God acted in our lives today and consider how we responded to his invitations to think, speak and act in a more Christ-like manner and in what ways we would like to be more faithful disciple tomorrow. And Psalm 51 Create a clean heart in me, O God. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness. In the great tenderness of your love, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my guilt, and from my sin cleanse me. Create a clean heart in me, O God, and renew within me an upright spirit. Do not cast me out from your presence. And do not withhold your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And let a spirit of willingness sustain me. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Psalm 67. May all peoples and nations praise you, O God. May God be gracious to us and bless us. May he let his face shine upon us. That your way may be known on earth and your salvation among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations sing and shout with joy. For you judge the people with righteousness and guide the nations on the earth. Let the peoples praise you. The earth has brought forth its fruits. May God, our God, bless us. May God indeed bless us. And may all the ends of the earth revere him. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, 
as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And finally, Psalm 25. May all peoples and nations praise you, O God. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. In you, my God, I trust. I shall not be disappointed. My enemies shall not rejoice at my expense. Indeed, none of those shall be disappointed who rely on you. Give me knowledge of your ways, O Lord. Instruct me in your paths. Make me walk in your truth and teach me. Because you are my saving God. It is on you that I have relied at all times. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Good night and God bless. Have a peaceful, joyful night. God bless.